Hello, everyone. And so welcome to our session on building the world we deserve. I'm Laura Maher. I lead the infrastructure portfolio at Siegel Family Endowment. Siegel is a private foundation based in New York City that's interested in how technology is reshaping society, specifically through our three portfolio areas of learning, workforce, and infrastructure. And so we've been working to promote a new framework for infrastructure that recognizes the interdependence between its physical, digital, and social dimensions. And we believe this way of thinking is a lot more aligned with the realities of our modern world. And it's this framework that we're looking forward to diving into today. So with me in this session are Michael McWhorter from Stantec and Melissa Huerta from the Mozilla Foundation. So it might seem a little wacky that this renowned global design and delivery firm and the technologists who brought you the Firefox browser are equal parts of this picture, but it's exactly that type of silo that we wanna break down today. So just a quick overview of our session. I'm gonna be setting the stage with Siegel Endowment's concept of infrastructure and its implications. I'm then gonna turn it over to Michael from Stantec and he's gonna talk about the work that they're doing at the intersection of what we would consider to be physical and social infrastructure. We'll then pivot over to Melissa, who's going to share more about the Mozilla Foundation's focus on the intersection of digital and social infrastructure. And then we'll move into a Q&A with the panelists and open it up to questions from our viewers. So um, please just use the Q&A if you have a question and we'll um, try to get to you. So let's, uh, let's dive right in. So infrastructure influences everything. The built environment, whether it's roads cutting through communities, reliably safe drinking water, or access to our digital world can calcify the socioeconomic and racial divides. But good infrastructure on the other hand can create a more fair and just society. So you can see here in yellow, some statistics demonstrating the disproportionate impact that lack of infrastructure can have, especially on poorer and less resource countries. So 3.7 billion people have no access to internet connection, which is about 55% of the world's population. But if you break that down in terms of type of country, there's 87% in developed countries have access, 55 in developing, and just 19% in the least developed countries. So quite a big, um, quite a big gap. So for years we've been underinvesting in infrastructure, despite its central role in our lives. So you can see in blue some pretty jarring statistics. So the first is that the world faces a $15 trillion infrastructure gap that is both in new projects needed and deferred maintenance costs, according to the Global Infrastructure Hub. But the size of that gap actually triples if we want to include all the additional investments required to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But you know, this is more than just a budget problem. We think we need to reimagine infrastructure from the ground up. So when most of us think about infrastructure, we probably think about it in one of these dimensions. We probably think of physical infrastructure, like the built world. It's roads and bridges and parks, but also public utilities like trains and sewage systems and electrical grids. Or we might think of digital infrastructure. These are the assets that enable digital communications, cell towers, broadband, cables, satellites, as well as the data, the hardware and software and the coding that allows them all to function together. Or we might think of social infrastructure. Those are the public institutions like libraries and schools, shared public spaces like parks or community organizations like faith centers and cultural groups that shape the way that we interact with one another. While physical, digital, and social dimensions of infrastructure have traditionally been treated kind of as separate issues, infrastructure doesn't really operate like this in the real world. You know, a library is not just a storage facility for books. It forges community bonds and it offers people digital resources. A road isn't just this paved surface for vehicles. It's a vital artery for commerce and for social connections, one that is now governed as much by digital systems like Google Maps or Waze as it is by individual drivers. And when you post a comment on Twitter or you join a meeting like this one, you're relying on a vast network of physical structures like cell towers, transatlantic cables and server farms, as well as invisible structures like radio signals, network protocols and coding. And the reality is that each of these dimensions influences the other and it's essential to recognize this interdependence if we're to get smart about infrastructure. So how can we practically take this high level concept forward? We think that we need to define, design, govern, and fund infrastructure differently. So just take each of these concepts in turn. So the first is define. You know, everyone agrees that roads and bridges are infrastructure, but what about all of the other things that make society function? Like cell networks and satellite arrays, those public spaces in schools, e-commerce and these tools for social interaction. So as these digital technologies are changing the way we live, the divide between what we consider to be infrastructure and not is called into question. And so we need to regularly up, update um, and assess our definition of infrastructure so that all people can continue to meaningfully participate in society. 
define. So if we relegate design, or sorry, design, <laughs> if we relegate design into just one discrete phase that involves putting together blueprints, we miss this opportunity to achieve a broader set of goals. So it's not just what we build, it's how it gets built. It's the projects we select, it's the people we involve, the labor we use, the materials that we incorporate, the funding structure, and the long-term maintenance and stewardship models. Each of these moments offers an opportunity to ensure that the assets we're working with are sustainable and resilient um, and equitable beyond any one of their component parts. Govern. So governance is a really thorny question, now more than ever with the digital dimension shaking up the norms of power, profit, and politics. But a multidimensional approach, we think, can enhance both new and existing infrastructure. So for existing infrastructure, there are already many governance tools that exist, like engineering standards and building codes. But we think they can be augmented by adding additional disciplines, like technology and data implications, into the current mandates, business models, supply chains, and regulatory bodies. And now for innovations that we consider to be new infrastructure, we should approach governance not just by arbitrating in these small increments, but by thinking about the overarching paradigms we want and then aligning our regulation accordingly. And finally, funding. So a multidimensional approach requires new calculations for return on investment in order to better allocate and distribute funding. So on the value side, we think that investments in infrastructure should create value on multiple levels. Some value can be measured easily and immediately like bridge tolls, but a much value is also indirect long-term and non-linear like curating an inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem for long-term economic growth. We need better ways to capture the total value created across all three dimensions. And then on the cost side, all dimensions of infrastructure depreciate over time, whether you're talking about a road, a software, social structure, or skills. So we think that budget should account for the total cost of infrastructure that includes lifetime maintenance and performance management. So applying a more multidimensional ROI will show that who benefits um, as well as what the total real cost is. And we think this is a critical to ensuring that infrastructure is funded adequately and sustainably and by the appropriate actors. So as you can see, this is a pretty big, broad picture. So what does this look like in action? Um, I want to turn it over to my co-panelists and they'll tell you a little bit more about how they've been implementing their work. And so we're going to start with Michael McWhorter. He's going to introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about Stantec. Good afternoon, everyone, or depending where you are in the world, I guess it might be a different time. But uh, um, yeah, I'd like to just introduce Stantec a little bit and, and, and what we do, I guess, as part of the community that brings infrastructure uh, to life following the, the general process that uh, Laura's just gone through there. Um, so if we jump to the next slide quickly there. Yeah, so Stantex, uh, uh, you know, we're one of the largest engineering firms in the world, a consulting engineering firm, We've got 22,000 employees around the world and, and have, you know, uh, representation in, in a lot of places around the world, 350 different locations where we have offices and many more where we work where we don't have offices. We jump to the next slide. And uh, we work in a, a really broad range of sectors as well. Um, we, uh, you know, buildings, energy and resources, that's often a lot of power generation um, or transmission uh, issues like that. Environmental services, infrastructure, which is the transportation and buildings, um, and then in the water sector as well. And you can tell from some of the photographs there that the, some of the images, um, some of the projects that we work on are, are pretty large in scale, um, you know, up to tens of billions of dollars of capital work. And we also work down at uh, your household scale in some situations and where it works too. So we see a, it's kind of the breadth of what infrastructure can look like in the built environment. Onto the next slide there. And um, so Stantec, we, our, our tagline, and we talk about it as kind of our promise to the people that we work with is that we always design with community in mind. And this is really the ethos that we follow um, that allows us to make what we consider to be holistic infrastructure. We're always trying to think about the, the thing that we end up building, how will it really serve the community uh, that we're working with? And that sort of fundamental um, underpinning is, is really important to us. We generally live and work in the um, environments that we, uh, or communities that we um, are doing our work in. Um, and so like it's personal for us to make sure that infrastructure comes through and, and delivers something that the community really needs well. On the next slide. So I just wanted to talk about like quite a unique example in some ways and, and talk about how that process can go through to get even a little bit more specific. So, you know, generally infrastructure needs to address a, a challenge that's in the community and, and one that uh, I think many folks are aware of is the, the challenge that uh, sanitation holds in, in some uh, places around the world. 
and you can you know this is in um in kenya um in a lovely town called malindi and they need more infrastructure to support the um the, the proper sanitation services that the community need there and it's um, an example of something that's quite prevalent in a lot of places around the world and it can it really it comes down to uh, a question of money in some situations and it's too expensive at the moment to do that so in places where i live uh, at the moment in washington dc like you know there's a process involved and the cost is actually significantly higher than that per year per person to deal with sanitation but we have the infrastructure built and we have the funding to go with it but in uh, places like Malindi at the moment there aren't there's not that infrastructure and there may not even be the finances to work with it so that's kind of the community environment that this project needs to uh, to work within jump to the next slide please so we're um, uh, partnering there with a really amazing uh, social entrepreneuring firm uh, called Sanovation that's their logo up in the in the top right of the screen there and um, so Sanovation have lived in the community in Kenya for um, in some cases uh, their entire lives and, and the business has been running there for the last five to seven years. And so they really understand the challenges which are there and they've spent a lot of time thinking about the, what the community needs for its, uh, proper sanitation and also how to deliver it in the environment that's there. They, they know that the solution that works in so many other places may not work there because of local challenges and they've really put some thinking behind, um, well, what is a unique and innovative solution that will use what's there? And they've come up with what's shown here in the diagram. You kind of have, you, know, you can see the trucks. Those trucks are typically what is used to collect waste um, in uh, cities in Kenya. Um, they're not in a situation where they have sewers, such as you might see in, in like, say, in Washington, D.C., where I live. And they, they bring it to a treatment plant. And that in itself is proving a very difficult uh, way for infrastructure to work in uh, in environments like uh, Kenya, where there's not a lot of support which is required. So Sanovation have got this innovative idea and a way that they can build a, a slightly different type of infrastructure that will, will serve the local needs of the community there. Um, and so like they'll bring in biomass, um, you know, it's a waste product that's uh, sitting around not used, they'll mix it with the other waste product and they'll make a, um, a valuable product which can then be sold on to factories. So they've got this circular economy concept, something that really works in with all the environment that's there and they've got a, a great idea, an innovative idea. If you jump to the next slide. And so um, just, you know, I, I won't go into the details here, but what they've, they've got, a, um, they needed to have a business model that worked to support this as well. It's just having a good technical idea because that was one of the boundaries that has always been with sanitation in developing countries. It's, uh, we know, I guess, how to deliver the infrastructure, but how to fund it and properly run it has always been a challenge for us. And so they've got a, um, um, a business model that when you look at serving a town of about 100,000 people, it can uh, you know, provide a good amount of employment for folks there, and it can actually you know, be profitable and therefore sustainable and something that could be a, um, you know, a game-breaking or game-changing idea. Jump to the next slide. And so Sanovation themselves, uh, you know, undertook to get a pilot working. And so on the left hand side there, you can see the pilot uh, factory that they built and some of the uh, waste sawdust, which they gather from, um, uh, from uh, industries that create that as a waste. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see the product that they're producing after they've mixed it with the, um, the sludge that they're getting from the exhausted trucks that are in the uh, operating and, and coming in. And then what they needed to do was to move that into a full scale. So if you jump to the next slide. So this is where Sanovation reached out to Stantec. You know, Stantec has the experience of um, you know, engineering skills, also project delivery skills. Uh, you know, what, who are all the actors that need to work in order for an idea, a great idea and a concept to be brought through to something that's full scale. So Sanovation felt that they needed some uh, professional engineering support for that. And so they reached out to uh, Stantec. And so we've worked with them to carefully come up with a design which is you know designed so that it obviously will meet the overall community goal which they're trying to do it's something that will fit in with the neighbors around them uh, you know we've planned and, and thought very carefully about how things will work at the site so the operators and visitors and other people from the community who will come to see this infrastructure and to use the infrastructure um, to make sure that they have uh, you know good and safe and, and enjoyable experience there so all of those things kind of show that how we see that holistic infrastructure really comes together. You need to understand the community and what the challenge is. You need to have you know, a good and innovative idea that would do it. And then you need to bring those um, 
you know, engineering skills that so many of us have, um, you know, to bring it through to the full scale. So I'll pass it on now to, to Laura again. Yeah, thanks so much. I think it's just a great example of really taking the idea, the values that you want um, and, and applying it across the whole project cycle, not just the one discrete design phase. So thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Melissa um, and she will tell us a little bit more about what Mozilla is doing at the intersection of um, digital infrastructure and social infrastructure. So, Melissa. Sure, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, my name is Melissa Huerta and as, as Laura mentioned, I'm, I'm with the Mozilla Foundation. I know many of you here know Mozilla quite well, and so I appreciate you being here. And for those of you who are less familiar, uh, Mozilla is probably best known for the Firefox browser uh, and our role in the open source ecosystem over the last 20 years. So we're a global community of engineers, developers, designers, policy experts, and community organizers with over 10,000 volunteers who build and localize our products and who share this, this vision of an open internet that's accessible for all. We also engage in exploratory research to address uh, existing systemic models in the tech industry that might be causing unintentional harm or intentional harm uh, to the public. So, no, that was great, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. So today I'm here to share with you a new initiative we're standing up um, in partnership with others, including the Siegel Family Endowment, and to invite you all to get involved. Um, last year, the Mozilla Foundation decided to focus on the need for trustworthy AI. We recognize that AI shapes our lives in ways we might not even see. It has you know, great potential to help humanity, but it can also harm us. And AI makes decisions for us and about us, but not always with us. And I think one of the bigger problems is there's very little we know about how those decisions are made. So one effort to start addressing this issue, um, we focused on data, the collection, usage, commodification, and storage of data and specifically alternative models of data governance. Um, so this is the Data Futures Lab at Mozilla. So as you all know, we generate enormous amounts of data. Every time we click on a link, open an app, order an Uber, buy a book online, or ask our smart speaker for the weather, we're creating data that is analyzed, collated, stored, sold, and frequently used in ways we don't see and can't imagine. And while data itself is agnostic, um, it's currently being fed into systems designed to commodify and create value, and thus the new capital. We know that the value from this new capital almost never remains at the site of the data creation or with the people from whom it's collected. The data economy in this sense is following very old rules. The extraction of value from the site of resources is certainly not a new story. So these current rules mechanize the stewardship of data, its value, and its aggregate power away from those who create that data in the first place. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the harms resulting from this extraction are becoming increasingly material and severe. Uh, these harms have in some ways become more egregious than their analog counterparts because they are at first less apparent. They are invisible, but deeply felt and hugely impactful. We see them in labor disputes, in access to public services, and in the echo chambers of information so many of us find ourselves in today. Next slide, please. These harms are magnified because so few actors control how data is extracted and managed. We as consumers, as users, and as really as the public, um, have almost no insight into or control over if and when data is used against our interests or against the public interest by platforms who hold consolidated market positioning and use it to their advantage. This reality has created a dangerous precedent. And so, yes, we need regulation and enforcement, but they're not enough. We also need new pathways for both emerging and entrenched actors. Next slide, please. You know, it, it may be that we um, want to harness this data in ways that benefit individuals and communities. And it may be that those platforms that I was previously talking about also have this goal of harnessing data in ways that benefit individuals and communities. But right now there are obstacles preventing innovators from building different ways of stewarding data. You know, these obstacles include the fact that innovators are disconnected from one another by sector and geography, and they're not working in concert. Um, that the field lacks building blocks that will allow projects to leapfrog one another. 
and that technologists are often solving problems that are not rooted in community needs. So all of these obstacles sort of prevent us from building a more just and equitable data future. Next slide, please. Um, importantly, in spite of these obstacles, uh, individuals, we found that individuals and organizations around the world are working to change how data is used in society. So in the first half of this year, Mozilla collaborated with external researchers to create a catalog of 250 literature resources and identified 110 governance-like projects. And these were then you know, categorized into these seven categories that they are bucketed into these seven categories that they identified. Um, it's a little hard to see maybe, but it's data commons, data collaboratives, data cooperatives, data fiduciaries, data trusts, indigenous data sovereignty and therefore indigenous data governance, and data marketplaces. But many of these are not working with each other. They're not connected. They don't know that each other exists um, and they're definitely not uh, sharing knowledge or collectively getting the support that they need. And so the Data Future lab, Futures Lab um, aims to connect and support these innovators to enable them to do even better and more impactful work. It's designed really to support existing and emerging networks of practice as they imagine and build a different data future, one that balances this power dynamic between profit-driven platforms and individuals and communities. And um, our proposal really is to support this critical work by bridging across key disciplines, uh, resourcing invention and testing of new models, funding key aspects of infrastructure, facilitating open learning and evolving based on this learning, and you know, supporting a growing network of people to resource this effort and to engage on data stewardship issues. Um, the lab is in a physical space, um, but if it were, maybe we'll reach out to Stantec to build it. Um, but we do imagine it as a home for innovation. And the central premise of the lab is that without this sort of ecosystem level support, coordination and learning, this work will continue to be scattershot and insufficiently resourced and outgunned by more dominant approaches. And so they am, the lab aims to fill this ecosystem level need by reimagining, uh, reconstituting and rebalancing the rules of the game. And, last three. and by changing these rules, we change the game. We're not just imagining the future, we're building it. And right now, you know, we believe that the future of data can be creative and equitable and just and with participation from experts in the field asking and answering difficult questions, um, the Data Futures Lab can help get there. So, um, you know, you can read more and join our working groups through uh, mzl.la slash data futures. It's the link at the bottom of the slide. And I really hope you will join us. Thank you. Thanks, all. Um... I think what I mean really strikes me about both of your work that is that you're solving problems that are rooted in community need and you know some of them are you know physical and like present and proximate next to you whereas you know Mozilla is reshaping these digital spaces that we might not realize in the moment but that have real real world implications that will manifest themselves within our physical communities and so um, I think for us we see your work as um, you know so two sides of the same coin and, and just like really excited to bring these communities together so um, I'm going to take us off screen share so we can see one another's faces. Um, and yeah, I have a, a couple of questions for both Michael and Melissa, but if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and um, we will uh, get to them as, as we come. So um, yeah, I guess the first question I have for both of you is just that, you know, the idea of, you know, rooting things in community and um, and the idea of manifesting this multidimensional infrastructure and this holistic approach seems really simple, but, you know, it's not always done everywhere. So I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about, you know, what do you see as the barriers to implementing this approach and, and what are some supports that you draw on uh, when, uh, when moving forward with your work? Uh, Michael, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the, uh, the, the, the story that we always see and, and really believe is, is strong is that it takes um, many, many people in a lot of different um, uh, roles for a good piece of infrastructure to, to really come into existence. Um, you know, and, and it, you know, that can start with an idea, needs to start with an owner, somebody needs to want to have the infrastructure at the end of that. Um, and that could be anything from a municipal group, a private company, you know, individuals maybe, but, but somebody needs to fill that owner role. Um, then, you know, they need to, they've obviously created the idea, then you need to move on to 
having people that can uh, you know design uh, that idea and, and make sure that it meets codes and standards and, and the type of thing that you talked about before uh, you know that in itself is fine but then you need someone to build it and that's quite a lot of specialist skills and, and most designers um, you know don't have the the wherewithal to actually go out and, and you know build the things that we're talking about um, and then obviously someone needs to operate or maintain or keep the, the infrastructure going well and so I guess you know in terms of barriers uh, uh, for that, oh, I missed the funding piece of it, which is also quite important. Someone needs to have the, the money that's going to uh, support whatever that project is. Maybe it's the owner, but maybe it's a, a separate entity. Um, and so it, when we see barriers that come up, they can be at any one of the points along there. And if there's not capacity in any of those, in, in one of those roles, it doesn't matter how much capacity you have in the others, because everybody has these unique skills. So I often actually think some of the jobs, like if you you split up the amount of time that would take one person to do everything that it takes to move a job from a project from concept to build infrastructure there. You know, if it's a, if, it, if the project is worth, you know, a million dollars or tens of millions of dollars, you're talking about one person, if they want to do it by themselves, it would take them their entire lifetime. So you see that you need to bring a lot of people together in order to make something like that happen and to work well. And the barrier that we see is when there's a, a weakness somewhere along that chain, which is often a capacity issue if, if that, community or environment doesn't have that uh, specific capacity which is needed. Amasa, how about, how about you? How is it similar or different? It's, it, I mean, yeah, it's definitely similar. You know, I like to look at it in this um, framework of like people, policy and products. So on the people side, you know, there, there are too few resources, again, to the funding um, uh, point that Michael is just making. There are too few resources to really complete reliable data stewardship solutions, um, and they require a complex, diverse set of expertise that can be hard to identify, recruit, and manage. So we need people with these skills, and then we need those people working together, right? And then on the product side, most problem-oriented solutions start from scratch, and then they kind of never get to scale, or they're not started with scale in mind. And... Um, um, and without sort of that knowledge sharing of best practices, it's difficult to move forward from kind of the first steps. And then at the intersection of people and product, um, solutions often begin and end with data and tech and leave out the sort of the necessary learning that incorporates context and community that can really help these interventions not only grow to scale, but to also be the success that um, folks are looking for designing for these to be. And then lastly, with policy, you know, we need a regulatory environment that supports and promotes the sort of innovation um, and one that is willing to enforce those policies on bad actors. And so the challenge is not these, the, these things, the bigger challenge is not that these three things exist, it's more that they actually need to work together in concert to push um, a vision forward. And the question is, are people willing to work together? And I think something, you know, I mean, those, that's where the conversation really starts. Yeah, I mean, I think too, the having the groups, like assembling sort of the groups of diverse both perspectives and skills that you all assemble to make the work happen is really interesting. And um, one of the other things that kind of strikes me about, both, you know, both of your work is that it's, you're piloting different models that are, you know, you know, different to the, um, the traditional models that are, that people would normally use. So, you know, Sinovation is a community oriented social venture and the Futures Lab is really looking at this array of ways to structure, um, you know, data and how we access and deal with our data. So I was just wondering if you could both talk a little bit more um, about the models that you're engaging in and sort of what are the benefits um, to kind of doing things like a little bit in a different way. And at the same time, like what are the downsides of like trying to pursue this new model at scale or pursue a new type of model at scale? And Melissa, maybe we start with you this time. Sure, thanks. Um, so I think if, if, we're, if we're framing the traditional models to be where platforms are mining data from their users, then we're looking at them doing so without explicit consent and then using that data to shape the algorithms that then in turn impact the users in ways that we're just, we're just starting to really see what, what that is, right? And so the problem of this sort of centralization of data within a few very powerful, so the problem is the centralization, right, of the of um, data within very few and very powerful companies. And so this model allows, so this model, right, this alternative model of the Data Futures Lab allows for alternative models to thrive and to shift power away from those profit-driven platforms and back to individuals and communities. We don't necessarily have the answer on what all the benefits and downsides are, 
Um, I imagine that the traditional models are, I guess, are you asking for, I mean, the benefits of um, countering the traditional models is that we're, we're bringing in new thinking. Um, and I would also say that um, even the way the traditional models are right now, that's relatively new, right? I mean, the space has only been around for the last 50, 20 years or so. And so in kind of the, the timeline of humanity, there's still so much room for innovation. And so I would encourage us to think of what we think of the traditional models as, hey, maybe they were iteration one and maybe it's time to move or you know whatever version you want, but maybe it's time to look at a new model. And I think the benefit of that is less of this siloed corporate structure and more of a community driven decentralized way that, um, that hopefully puts empowering people at the center. And uh, yeah, I guess, you know, the, the standard model for delivery of sanitation services, I guess around the world is, you know, have, you have a municipal government which um, raises funds, maybe it's a tax, maybe it's a, a rate, maybe it's you know, a, a bill, like I get a bill in the month, every mail, sorry, a month in the mail every month. Um, and and, and that, that then pays for the service. And I think it's really interesting, um, often working in the sanitation sector, like folks are looking for um, models that, that get away from that. And they're often looking for complete, something that's completely sustainable and like pays for itself. Um, and it's really hard to do that. Like it's not how it happens in Washington DC or somewhere else. Like people have to pay money in. It's a, it's a, it's a service which is required and, and someone needs to find a way to pay for it. So the, the beauty of what Sanovation have done is that they have, you know, thought outside the box, bought something else into it, and they've, you know, understanding what community needs and, and what the markets were, because they, they've, they've produced a product which the market will then pay for, which then can fund the whole chain going backwards. So, and there, what we've got in that situation is they've, they've really set up a true public-private partnership approach. They've really partnered with the local municipality. They're, they understand what the municipality is great at doing and, and what is challenging for the local municipality, and they you know, work together in a really close partnership with a lot of dialogue with them. Um, and then Sanovation are bringing in this idea and they're bringing in, um, you know, the, the private part of it that can set it up and make it run. And so I think like that, you know, it's it's really easy to say P3 and public private partnership and, and it looks different in different places. Um, but like the, the way that they've really done a deep dive and found something that actually ticks all the boxes along the whole way there. That, that's what really makes uh, what they've done great. And I think for anyone else that's trying to do a model like that as well, that same depth of understanding of the situation that they're working in communities, markets and all that sort of stuff will be really critical to doing it. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it's not necessarily a formulaic either. It's just bringing together the right people with the right skills and understanding the context and really adapting it for that. And kind of on that note too, we had a question come in that you know says, you know, most of the time the the problem and the people with the skills to solve the problem aren't always in the same place. So, you know, how what are some ways that we can we can better deal with that? Joe, well, maybe I mean I can talk about that with innovation. I mean, um, you know, the the this this project happens in Kenya, and I live in Washington D.C. Um, we actually had uh, you know people from our team from around the world. We had folks in U.K., folks in India, um, all contributing as well. Uh, to the solution that we bought uh, for it. There's a German um, in involvement as well. Um, and, and so like, we're blessed at the moment with an amazing resource uh, in the internet and, and what it can allow us to do, what we're doing right now. And we can share ideas and information, you know, faster than you would ever imagine. I, I see, you know, side story, I, when I started my engineering career, there was a gentleman that I worked with who remembered doing all his calculations with a slide ruler. I, I couldn't even tell you how to do that. And I can't, believe how you could do work, uh, engineering work without a computer, but it happened for so long. And so we have um, we have a lot of things that can allow us to work across that. Of course, what we found doing that work was, it's 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 one thing for us to have the ideas in, in America, but like we needed a local partner as well. So we actually did team with local engineering um, partners there as well, who had skills that Stantec doesn't have because they understand the Kenyan environment better. And so we were able to make that, um, you know, we recognized our weaknesses and, and their strengths and we made sure that we were able to use those to bring something that was really appropriate for the local environment. And so I think combination of technology and building relationships would be my answer to the question. That way we can bring anything we need anywhere. 
Um, I know Mozilla too has a, a global network of people and thousands and thousands of folks. So can maybe talk a little bit about the ways that you all convene the network and really make it more than the sum of its parts. Sure, yeah. Um, and also I kind of, um, before I get into that, I wanted to, I feel like this question is also saying like, how do these people find each other, right? And so I want to name that one of the challenges is language. And I don't just mean, I mean, both literally like the language that we're speaking in English um, and also the vocabulary. And so a lot of groups around the world, what we found, especially with this data stewardship work is that this, again, this work is happening. Um, and a lot of groups around the world have always been challenged, you know, are challenging notions of colonialism via the internet or the idea of ownership over data. And since that, since that implies that you can give it or sell it away. So I think there's a lot to learn from groups that are already looking at what we call data um, and in what we're calling innovative ways. And so I'd love to, I, I would love to shine a light on those voices and approaches and, and um, kind of meet them where they are, ask them questions. And some of those questions are like, how do we, what do they need from us? You know, how can we resources, resource their work? Um, how can we learn from them in an equitable fashion that isn't about appropriating or colonizing? And so to your point, Laura, like, yes, we do have this network of community members around the world. Um, they bring us so many valuable questions and insights on everything that we do. We, you know, we have the software infrastructure to, of course, uplift um, those questions and approaches that they're working with. And I think the work and the, the, the work that we, we really try to focus on is about finding connections that matter, that, are, that can grow um, and kind of grow out, you know, increase these concentric circles of folks working together. But ultimately, I think this is a really difficult challenge of if these, if these people exist in the world, how do they find each other? And how do we do it so we are not in the middle of that? Yeah, I think too, the sort of that notion of one, like finding each other, but two, once you do find each other, having a shared vocabulary really speaks to the ideas of like, what are the foundations that we're working with? Like, what are these foundational changes that we need? What are some of those just like understanding structures? So I was wondering actually, if you could both, um, you know, tell me, tell me if there was one thing, uh, like one massive foundational change that could happen maybe over the next three years that you think would have the, the longest term impact, what would that foundational change be? Uh, Michael, we, we could start with you. Sorry. Got it, sure thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, um... I don't know if you can do it in three years, but I think you can take a step towards it. Um, I mean, um, to, and, th and that is, you know, capacity building. Like we find, um, you know, I was saying before that the, if it's complicated infrastructure, like there are, there are obviously by definition, you know, technical challenges with making it happen, but sometimes even the simplest of infrastructure that we all know how to, to do well um, it's hard to get it to work because somewhere along the chain that I described before, there's not the capacity that you need. It, it could be that, you know, the design firms, are, um, you know, don't have the experience that they need to, to get it right. And they, you know, they miss something with the geotechnical work and then it doesn't work. Or, you know, maybe the contractor gets a good set of plans, but they don't build it uh, you know, well and make a, a fundamental mistake in there. And so the thing falls down or maybe the operations staff like hadn't really had the fundamentals explained to them and didn't get it. So that, building the you know identifying all those needs for capacity in a in a situation and then building all that that's the fundamental change that will, can really bring things through it that's more than a three-year effort but it's a it's a worthy one i think the other thing too is like um that i just touch on maybe with innovation that goes back to a question someone asked in the text as well the um you know having people that are ready to fund um, innovative ideas and, and things that get off the ground. I mean, I think since innovation situation, like if you look at their business model, it, it makes sense, but they need somebody to, to um, you know, take a, um, and, and back them a little bit to get that thing going and seeding it. So I do think like, you know, folks looking for um, ways that you can fund development projects like that in a slightly different way from, you know, the way that it might happen at the moment uh, would be really beneficial. Um, yeah, I think um, absolutely. My my answers would absolutely be about like capacity building, um, also about that social infrastructure that you you've talked about, Laura. You know, it's really about connecting people and projects and understanding. You know, that whole the whole is greater than the sum of its parts piece. 
Um, and I think I would just add, like, if we're looking at a three-year time frame, I would say, like, we need a we need a better regulatory environment. We need to, you know, how we need to know how to remove the current barriers that keep people out and implement new policies that enable more innovation and more connection and more learning across the board. Yeah. We um, have another question that came in from the chat, um, talking a little bit about, uh, you know, needing buy-in from government and local authorities. And so, you know, how do you um, kind of, in the challenging time, like, how do you kind of get that buy-in in a timely manner? Um, I know, Michael, you talked a little bit about this with innovation, um, and I know uh, maybe Mo, uh, Melissa could touch a little bit on um, Mozilla's work with getting, with working alongside governments and, and really kind of pushing the types of policy paradigms that we want to see instead of this, again, trying to kind of play whack-a-mole like with one thing at a time every time it comes up, you know, thinking through like what are the, what are the buy-ins that we need to kind of build the types of uh, data and digital structures that we want to see long-term. Yeah, maybe. Um, so on the innovation side, I mean, they, they spend a lot of time really making sure that they understood their, their local partners um, and doing that, like they, I mean, they have a, they have an MOU, like a, a form of a contract with the municipality that they're working with where they've, you know, both parties have sat down and described what they want to get from the arrangement and, and how it, um, how they can support one another to do it. So it was, it was good old fashioned relationship building that made it happen. I, I do think working through local governments and making sure that they're on site is really important. Like another, idea that, that comes to mind is we are lucky enough to be working with the Millennium Challenge Corporation from the US here, which is supporting the Millennium Challenge account in Mongolia um, with a really important water supply project there at the moment. And so that model there, you know, the Mongolian government is delivering the work, um, you know, with, with support uh, from MCC in the US. And like the fact that there's that local ownership is um, allows us to make sure that we are doing the project properly within local um, conditions and constraints and requirements and also allows like good dialogue like I was describing before to really happen um, in a way that we couldn't be doing it if, if we didn't have uh, people that like, really can form those detailed relationships which make sure that the challenges that can come um, from uh, you know governmental entities regulating things in a in a not fully holistic way they can be overcome through good sharing of information. Sure, and I guess um, from this side, we can, uh, I mean, I believe we're in the business of solving problems um, and everybody has a problem. And so it's more about, or a challenge I should say, that we can all work together to solve. And so when it, when we're talking about getting um, buy-in from authorities uh, and government, various government authorities, it's about framing the issue in a way that matters to them and their constituents and making sure that they are on board. That means a lot of working with local um, organizations, individuals, and partners. Um, and it's not about us pushing our agenda by any means. It's more about saying, asking, well, what do they think would be best for their constituents? And we see um, a lot of these conversations as learning opportunities, right? Um, I know that sounds like such a line, but it, we do see it as learning opportunities. <laughs> this stuff, you know, tech and the digital and the data and is it mine and is it yours and does, who does it belong to or does it, is it even a thing with ownership around it? These are new questions. These are brand new questions. This is a very new environment and we're using um, a traditional system or, you know, a system of laws to try to define that. And so I think we have this responsibility just as members of our communities to try to make that better and for, the, for these quote unquote traditional systems to serve our modern needs. Um, and so I just think it's more about we're, we're working together to sort of solve these problems. And if we can frame these issues in that way, then it's less like, are we pushing our agenda and more are we helping them sort of move their community in the direction that they want it to go? Yeah. I love um, kind of what, what both of you said, just, you know, it's about good old fashioned relationships. It's about asking people what they need. It's about asking people what they think and solving problems together. I think that's sort of the core of, you know, what we, what we think of, you know, is, is needed going forward. Um, we've got about five minutes left. So I, I feel like we kind of, we stayed at that 30,000 foot level. And so for maybe the last couple of minutes, I want to ask each of you, you know, just maybe what is one thing that people could do in their daily roles, like that they could start to make, kind of take a step to make that, um, you know, to make that 
holistic viewing of infrastructure and that really kind of inclusivity and equity in their work, um, you know, part of their daily routine. So um, yeah, just a minute or two on kind of like what the, what the next steps for people could be. And uh, Michael, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. I, I feel, you know, just some themes that we've touched on there. Um, you know, I think everyone can implement them every day in, in what they're doing. I think a lot of the folks who are listening in here are uh, engineers in, in one form or another and looking at it. And I guess I'd challenge you to make sure that you truly understand the situation that you're working in, the community that you're working with, what, what it looks like, and, and make sure that you start with them in mind and then and finish that way as well. Um, you know, I, I think also, um, you know, in terms of the capacity building thing like that can come from us as individuals like it's great when it comes from from larger entities but we, we don't need to wait for that like if you uh, are someone that needs mentoring like reach out and find someone who can and help you and, and learn a little bit from them that's that's more experienced engineers are better simply because they've got things wrong and it's better to learn that by, by asking someone else about what they got wrong rather than doing it yourself um, and if you do have that experience and you look around and you see somebody um, who could do with some mentoring, I think that is also a really good opportunity. Um, and doing that, it can be anywhere, it can be across borders, it can be inside your office, or well, that can create a, a stronger community of engineers and scientists that can bring forward um, this sort of thing. I think that will really provide a, you know, the, the, the change that we need, and we can do it from the ground up. Um. Absolutely, I agree with everything Michael just said. And I would, um, perhaps then I'll end up just repeating <laughs> what he said, but I would also say kind of, you know, th three things in particular is have conversations with those around you. You know, what is, what is, and around, from this perspective and the, and the thing that we're talking about right now, like about personal data and what is data to you? You know, challenge your assumptions and reach out to others in the spirit of learning. Um, they try to tell us, you know, that like we are our data, right? We are comprised of our data. But in my sort of reflective journey, I've kind of thought that data is just actually, it's a measure of our relationship with something else. And so then the shape um, that our data makes of us, this visual or diagram is actually the negative space, right? It's the shape of us, um, but that's not your full picture. That's not, that's not who I, I am not a negative space. And so it's, like it's the part understanding sort of the forces at play and kind of refusing to really dive into it as much as I can or refusing to let myself be commoditized in that way as much as, much as I can, as much as one person can. Um, I think the second thing is start thinking about ways to decrease the amount of data you're sharing um, unless it's on your terms, right? So then what does consent mean? And, and having these conversations and thinking through your relationship with what's going on day to day. Um, I think because, you know, let's start with ourselves first before we start designing um, for others. And then lastly, and then this is not sequential in any way, but like get involved, you know, join a working group with us. Um, I think you can find more information um, on our website or in our email that I know Laura's going to put up at the end. Um, but, you know, it's think about it, learn about it, and then like get involved, have these conversations with others and really, you um, take action uh, in your community, I think, and, and in this world that we're all building together. Yeah, and just, I think kind of mine would be, you know, something that we tried to do here today, which is just to, to see across silos too. You know, engineers are the frontline designers for physical spaces, for digital spaces and social spaces. And the choices that we make become the default choices for everyone. So, you know, thinking through, um, you know, what do you want those default choices to be? And like, what do we want? Or what kind of world do we want to build together, I think is really important. Um, and yeah, as you know, coming from, um, you know, at Siegel Family Endowment, we're, we're funders, we're conveners, we bring people together, but we really look forward to partnering with people like you all on the call who are, who are doing the hard work and who are um, kind of making it happen on the ground. So you know, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We have some, um, some more information on the slide if you wanna get in touch with us. And we just really look forward to you being a part of our broad, broad, wacky community. So have a, have a, good, rest of the, have a good rest of the conference.